It had been a difficult winter. The medical condition meant that I had not been driving, but I had decided enough was enough and I got the city link to Glencoe. I decided to get off up at the gorge and I would walk back down into the village. I manoeuvred up through the busy gorge to reach a good path through the glen. Here I was, a Campbell in Glencoe on April Fool's Day. It had been a long cold spring, one of the coldest in record, and the signs of this were obvious everywhere you looked. I decided to start my walk by heading off the main road to the south at first to get a view down the glen from there. A good path leads south from here by a bialach down into Glenetive, but I made my way over to a high point just above the gorge. I was happy with that so I decided to carry on with my walk. Down below I could make out a cairn in the floor of the glen below. There was nothing there that gave an explanation as to what it commemorates. I then headed over to the excellent path winding down the glen under the craggy heights of Unahigach. This stretch must have been part of the old road before a new route was blasted through the gorge just ahead. The path rises gradually as it heads back over towards the stunning Three Sisters. A backward glance gives a view of the busy main road down below as it passes the cairn we noticed earlier. This was a wonderful walk. Glencoe is a habit of making you feel insignificant in comparison to these brutal peaks that soar over you like evil guardians of the glen. There was a small cairn on a rock ahead where the path winds round it. I climbed onto the rocks and the glen opened out below. This must have been the old road. Just below where the road winds round another rocky outcrop at a substantial bridge sits the now derelict cottage that was once owned by Jimmy Savile. The path is now bounded by a dry stained dyke and it soon drops down to join the main road. This must have been the old road at one time. There was no direct road through the glen until 1785 and it was updated by Telford in 1800. The old disused cottage was badly vandalised a few months ago. The windows are now boarded up and the graffiti has been pretty much removed from the walls. The views from this old cottage over to the craggy mountain peaks are nothing short of magnificent. And in a deep gully, gouged out from between two of the three sisters, is a lost valley. The next tower was a relentless slog as I made my way down the pass to the loch. I eventually reached the bridge at the floor of the glen. There were still patches of ice formed in the loch. Just beyond this, a small single track road branches off to the right. I decided to take this route into the village. It was still a good three miles walk though. A few hundred yards further on, I arrived at the Clach Inn. Not a lot is recorded about its past, but it was certainly here in 1864. It is situated in a lovely spot. I was now on the outskirts of the village. At the entrance to the village is a lovely old bridge over the River Coe. There's a road to the right here that leads up to the Glencoe Lochen. I decided to go up for a look around. There's a romantic tale associated with this little lochen. Donald Alexander Smith was born on the northeast coast, at Forest to be exact. He emigrated to Canada in 1888. While there he became very wealthy indeed. He later became the governor of the Hudson Bay Company, the High Commissioner for Canada and Lord Strathcona. He returned to Scotland in 1895 and bought the Glencoe estate and had Glencoe House built for his Canadian wife and himself. The estate was created to make his wife, who was of American Indian descent, feel at home. 
Many plants, shrubs and trees were brought over from Canada in an attempt to make her feel at home, but despite all his endeavours he was eventually forced to return to Canada with his wife. This beautiful little loch in is idyllic, and it has been altered to make it wheelchair friendly. Above and to the northeast stands the unmistakable conical peak of the Pap of Glencoe. This wonderful view itself is worth the detour. The scene is probably not at its best at this time of year, but the wonderful snow-capped oh. peaks that surround it certainly make up for that. But it was still a pity that there was enough of a wind to cause waves, and I didn't get the wonderful reflections that make this loch so special. The views just kept getting better, and the view south from the top of the loch was absolutely superb. There are three waymark walks here, and the blue walk takes you up to a viewpoint. It may be quite short, but it certainly is steep. As I neared the top, the wonderful snow-capped peaks come back into view. I don't do steep very well. It was now downhill all the way. I wished all walks were downhill. The views back over to the mouth of the glen were majestic. Glencoe certainly is a magical place. When it's sunny, Glencoe is breathtaking. When it's wild, Glencoe is breathtaking. And when it's dull, well, it's never dull in Glencoe. The winding path led back to the village. Just across the old bridge is a war memorial and a summer seat with views back up the glen. I made my way down through the village with the wonderful conical Papa Glencoe as a backdrop. The name Glencoe Village only appeared recently and was only introduced in signs to differentiate the village from the actual glen itself. The village is split into three distinct parts. This part of the village is Carnach, and to the north and the other side of the river is Invercoe. On the main street here is the Thatched History Museum. There's a small village shop, a hotel, cafes, an inn, a large visitor centre, craft shops, a primary school, a church, a garage, and plenty of accommodation, and probably still not enough to satisfy the demand. Oh, and most importantly, the Glencoe Mountain Rescue Team. On the Balakulish Road we find another string of houses. This part of the village is known as Ty Fort, or Ferry House. I eventually arrived back at the crossroads where the Glencoe Hotel sits. I decided to head towards Invercoe to kill time until my bus came. The views over the village toward the wonderful snow-capped peaks at the mouth of the glen were stunning. At times it almost had an alpine look. It had been a wonderful sunny day. It hadn't felt cold until now. The temperatures had been dropping steadily for the last hour and it was now below zero. I took one last look around and then headed for the Glencoe Crossroads bus stop. The clocks had just changed in the previous day and the gloaming was creeping in as I gazed over to the west towards the Argar Mountains. 